Funding for Indiana Weekend is provided by Midas, Fine Line Construction, and Open Door Health Services. This is Indiana Weekend, some of the most interesting people and places from around our region. These are the stories you won't always see on the regular news, voices you won't always hear elsewhere. I'm John Strauss. This is a kind of news magazine show with stories just a bit off the beaten path. We're going to turn right here. Okay. Today, stories of outdoor fun and a powerful immersive learning project by Ball State students finding hope amid the scourge of MEP. But first, that outdoor fun. It's tempting in the winter to hibernate, to sit inside. We forget sometimes that the great outdoors is still pretty great even in winter. I love the winter, so that's why Josie and I walk out here as often as we can, at least four days a week. The cold doesn't bother you? Not at all. I love the bare trees. I love the cawing of the birds. She started walking when she got her first dog and a friend suggested I take him out here, and he, he was a Brittany, so he was a, a game dog, and he would just calm down. It was like he was in his element. So that's when I started coming out here, and then I found her as a tiny puppy, about two months old, and she just followed his lead. They went swimming, just fell in love with it. So this is where she's happiest. But wait a minute. What about all those bare limbs, leafless canopies? Can you really enjoy winter in the woods? Oh, it's beautiful in the winter. I mean, you just have to understand that you get to see the textures of the tree more against the bare sky, and there's still color, and I love it. I, I love how the trees just, you can see the very tops. You think of summer as the big time for state parks, but Tim Miller and his wife, Jane Carlson Miller, are glad to go anytime. They love winter walking and had done more than 10 miles the day that we met them at Fort Harrison. Well, I like to get out and move around. I hate just sitting still and the fresh air, um, looking at anything. I mean, even now the nature's not that gorgeous, but it's still pretty just to see things at different times of year. We're looking for animals, just moving, keeping moving and trying to stay young. <laughs> they visited all the state parks, hiking, biking, cross-country skiing. They like to come, stay overnight and see everything. Uh, I like all the seasons, but it, it has been gorgeous today because the snowflakes are just kind of slowly coming down. It's just, it's just pretty. Little uh, ice starting to form, but the, the air is good and fresh and get your cheeks nice and red. And <laughs> we do this all the time. We've traveled Clifty Falls. We've stayed in five different park inns, uh, walked all the trails there. We just love all the state park. The, the trails are well maintained, well marked, and you really can't lose come out here even for a day. You, you just get out you, and you get rid of all the tension and you just, you hear a little bit of quiet, you see the birds, and you do the... <sighs> even in the winter? Oh yes, especially in the winter. That's when more of the tension is because everybody is cooped up together in the winter where they can't get out. Whereas you get out here and you see there's four people rather than 60. And, you know, you see a couple of people on the trail and they're all very friendly. You wave hi and they wave hi and off you go. And if you're lost, you say, hey, where am I? And they're more than happy to stop and say, well, this is where you're at. This is where you need to go. And they meant in a nice way. <laughs> they're from Napanee. He's retired Navy, 56, working in law enforcement now. They fly around to the state parks in their own light plane. We go and stay at the end in the state parks. And each one is very unique. Clifty Falls, you're stand, sitting up, you're about 500 feet up, and you look right down on the Ohio River, and you see the tugs, and you see the, the river boats going through, and the, the waterfalls there, we got there when it was dry, we walked the creeks, and then the next day it rained, and you got beautiful waterfalls going down, you get to see all that, it was just beautiful. These are moderate trails, these are not, uh, not difficult, you don't walk through any creeks or, or rocks or anything, it's all very easy uh, walking, but you can put some miles on and just enjoy. And if you can just get a, a little quiet and you just sort of feel your shoulders relaxing, you just sort of feel yourself breathing a little easier. And, you know, you just don't get, you get out of the rat race. He's a former Tomahawk missile chief who's been everywhere and still decided to come back home to Indiana. I've been around the world three times, been on every continent of Antarctica, and I chose to come back here. I was stationed in San Diego. I was stationed in New York City. 
I was stationed in Maine. I was stationed in Norfolk, Virginia. I was stationed in Bremerton, Washington. And I was an instructor in Chicago, in, at North, North Chicago and Great Lakes. And I've been on every, every, in every state. I've been on every continent, like I said, except for Antarctica. And I chose to come back to Indiana. You don't have to go to the farthest parts of the state for a good hike, of course. For many walkers, the best spot is the local mall. Warm, dry, and friendly. I think it's a great thing because you meet people. I meet people that I would never have known and known about them. And it's a kind of a secondary friendship that you set up when you walk at the mall. It's a great thing. I, I would recommend it anyway. Sometimes you have to push yourself to do it. but. Uh, we have the window displays we can look at, and I go four times around, so that, that takes me, and I like to clip along. I have some friends I walk with that I have met out here, and we have a lot of things in common, so we just walk together and, and meet on other occasions too, at basketball games, etc. But uh, it's a great thing for anyone to get into, whatever your age, and I think you'll find that there is a man here who is 99 years old that walks. So. Um, never give up on it. <laughs> you get the idea from talking to people here that the company and friendships are as important as the exercise. Glenna Herker says Indiana is a great place to make friends. I've lived in a number of different places and I grew up in South Dakota where that's far away from here and it reminds me a lot of the people I knew when I grew up there. Um, the people here are very friendly and outgoing and they will speak to you whether they know you or not some places it's not quite the same or it takes them a while to kind of form a friendship and say hello and good morning and all that kind of thing but here you whoever I see I may not know them but I may say good morning or good afternoon or whatever. The Muncie Mall welcomes the walkers opening an hour early to accommodate them. Yes we love our walkers they're they're an integral part of, of our everyday life and they're just wonderful folks and and we we've gotten to know so many of them they come at some of them are our daily visitors here and we just we just love them they're they're seriously a part of of what we do here you know they add presence they add you know they're d different types of personalities and characters and it's another also type of in, in a way it's familiarity you know it's the same folks every day we know we're going to see them they know they're going to see us and um, it's just a very nice familial atmosphere actually in the mornings. A familiar sight around the mall is Bob Ingram, a Vietnam vet who's here for his health. About nine, ten years ago, I was a smoker. I got mad when I quit, so every time I wanted a cigarette, I'd go for a walk. And I got to where this progress, 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 and got over the habit anyway. People here are friendly. It seems walkers are like that wherever you go. Upbeat, glad to chat, glad to be here. Well, I went to the doctor, high blood pressure, so I thought, you know, I can move and walk, I can do that, and maybe I can get off the high blood pressure medicine, lose the weight, I'd be healthier, and there's a lot of people here walking. You know, the new year, everybody's motivated. <laughs> On a weekday morning, and some would say most mornings, the age range skews a little older among the mall walkers. The problem is all these people are old and I'm not. That's, that, that's my only problem, but <laughs> actually we used to come here when it was even earlier, but you know, the mall changed our hours on us. So I enjoy walking, I always have enjoyed walking. My wife's grandparents were famous walkers from uh, Switzerland and Germany, meaning they walked their whole life before it was popular to walk, you know. And uh, it's a nice time for me to relax. I enjoy it very much. With a little luck, I'll lose a pound. Beck says he walks three times a week, and that's just when his wife Christy steps in to correct the record. I, tell you I walk more than three times a week. Yeah. I walk at least that's six. She, she's the better walker. <laughs> okay, take over. There, there you go. You got your cameo moment. He is 67 and credits his walking for his good health. I fight arthritis, and, and uh, my doc tells me to keep moving. So that's one of the benefits. And burn some calories. It's a great time to think, uh, plan what you're going to do, solve problems of the world, and enjoy it very much. I'm thankful that the mall's here and, and they open up to us for us and it's so convenient. And there's a, uh, although I'm not a part of the, the crew, there's a, quite a little culture out here, you know. 
The most exuberant face of the mall walking culture on this day is surely Idella Clark, a smiling 64. Walking helps my health. It helps me keep down stress. When I pray and walk and meditate, it just helps me. It keeps my heart rate in the right place. It helps lower my blood pressure. Walking does a lot of great things for me. And I notice walking helps keep you looking young and you'll be able to take care of your grandbabies and all of that good stuff when you're young. So I thank God because he gave me the strength to walk. Myself, I'm a speed walker. And I've been walking for years. I started walking at the Muncie Mall uh, about 20, 22 years ago. And I've been doing it ever since. And it has really helped my health. Every time I go for a checkup, the Lord blesses me to get a good report. And I'm just so thankful because walking has truly helped me. We do this every day, been there for 16 years. There's something about walkers. The ones having the most fun seem to be the ones who band together, like these members of the Indianapolis Hiking Club, out for their weekly Thursday hike in Eagle Creek Park. They go out for three, four, or five miles, and then come in to warm up a little, which is where we found Marthine Kohlmeyer. I've always, you know, been very particular about maintaining my health. And for the first time, especially on camera, I'm gonna tell you my age, which I don't do very often, but I'm 80 years old. And I have been hiking uh, religiously every Thursday out here at Eagle Creek since I retired from American United Life Insurance Company. Because when you're retired, you look for some kind of a hobby. And since I was already interested in keeping my physical health, I started hiking. And before you know it, it's like a family affair. You know, you become very acquainted and very close to the people that you hike with. And in fact, when I first started, I thought I'm going to be the only one that's going to be out here interested in hiking in the wintertime. But boy, when you come out here and you find, you know, 25 or 30 other people that are doing the same thing, you don't feel like such a, you know, a loner. You find people that you have things in common with, and that really makes it nice. The hiking club includes nearly 600 members, a website with a very detailed schedule, something like 2,000 hikes per year. For us uh, heavy duty hikers, uh, we just dress for it. If you just dress warm enough for it, uh, it's no problem. And you, you know, keep healthy all winter long. Now I'm a single person, so living alone can be very uh, lonely. And so you look forward to, you know, coming out here on Thursday and having the comradeship and the conversation with, with your friends. Yeah, that's very important. Younger members come out on the weekends when many of the group's hikes are out of town. Last year, some members visited all 25 Indiana State Parks, but Marthine is happy right where she is. I love Eagle Creek Park. I love it. Yes, I really do. I love the woods. I like hiking in the woods. It's not quite as hard on your hips as walking on the concrete. And I like communing with nature. On a closing note, I don't take medication for anything. And I'm 80 and I'm in perfect health. So that tells you something about it, doesn't it? It's a fun club, but they take their passion for exercise seriously. Ed Wright's job is called Pathfinder, meaning he schedules something like six walks per day, every day of the year. I would say the majority is the camaraderie of like-minded people, uh, most of which, not all of which, but a lot of which are retired. So a lot of us who hike on weekdays tend to be retired, and we have every conceivable profession you can imagine. On today's hike, we had two doctors, a psychiatrist, uh, vice presidents, nurses, uh, you name it. Phil Coons is the group's photographer. These are some of his photos. He says, of course the members love hiking and the outdoors, but there's more than that. It's a very social club, so, you know, people become friends and, you know, hike, hike together and talk. Uh, sometimes we go out to eat after a hike. Uh, some people have called it a hiking club that likes to eat or an eating club that likes to hike. 
you make a lot of friendships uh, in the hiking club. Uh, I've really enlarged my uh, number of friends since I joined. I heard a, I was a colleague that joined the hiking club a long time before I did, and I heard him talking about the hikes he was on. It just sounded like so much fun. And then uh, I was about a little over three years ago, I saw, I was hiking out here and I saw a group hiking and uh, they looked like they were having so much fun and I, I'm sure it was uh, part of the hiking club. These are people who like to keep records. They record all their miles. One member has more than 19,000 and he's not alone. Phil Coons, a 71-year-old retired physician and psychiatrist, has a different motivation. One of the reasons I hike now, you know, for the last year and a half, is I had a heart attack, a mild heart attack on one of the hikes. And it's been proven that if you continue exercising after your heart attack, you'll live longer. Wait a minute, a heart attack? Not on a hike, though. Yeah, on a hike. Yeah, it was, uh, it was on uh, Shackamack State Park. And uh, believe it or not, I drove all the way to Methodist Hospital. <laughs> that sounds a little scary. Well, it was. I discreetly excused myself. I didn't tell anybody. Drove to the first uh, convenience store, got some aspirin, chewed them up, and then uh, drove to Methodist. In case you're looking for a map, Shackamack is an hour and a half southwest of the hospital. Injuries happen on some of these hikes. But we've had people that have broken ankles, uh, broken uh, arms, uh, people with stress fractures. Uh. Pretty tough bunch, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> most of their outings don't feature emergency medical help, but most of the veterans, like Bob Criz, have stories of their own, often about how they got started. So I started hiking, actually walking, when I was 16. And the reason I started is because I didn't have a car and my girlfriend lived two miles away. So I had to hike or walk to there and back, and the walking ultimately turned into hiking. So since I started hiking, I figured my personal mileage, not including the club, is over 100,000 miles. The Indianapolis Hiking Club folks all talk about the health benefits, though it sometimes takes a while to get there for the newcomers. They probably are surprised at how out of shape they are when they go on a very short hike, sometimes as short as two or three miles, it seems to be a chore. And I always advise them to start slow, buy good shoes so that your ankles are protected, and then build up. It's, it's good for your internal organs, it's good for you physically, it's good for you mentally, it's good for stress, and I'd recommend it to anybody of any age. The hikers all seem to have that healthy glow of the outdoors. Bob is 79 years old. If they find the fountain of youth, you'll probably have to walk to get to it. I've been active physically all my life uh, with sports, and uh, I just utilize walking as uh, uh, my final effort to stay in shape until my wake. <laughs> if you found yourself smiling with Bob Chris, maybe you got a sense of the infectious optimism of the hiking club folks and the mall walkers and the people at Fort Bend. You could say they're high on fitness, hooked on health. That's more than just an expression. The book Positive Addiction talked about the benefits of running and meditation 40 years ago. It seems that chasing good feelings of one kind or another is just something we do as people. And of course, not all addictions are positive. How many times have we read about the scourge of meth, for example? Now, a new project from a group of Ball State students and their professors is taking a new look at meth, the faces of addiction and possible solutions to the drug crisis. Being high on meth is like being on fire from the inside out. Being high on meth is like nothing else I've ever felt. It's good and bad all at once. It's pure bliss and joy and you feel more free than you ever have and at the same time you feel um, more scared than you ever have. It starts stirring in you and then it's so overwhelming and euphoric that you can feel, I mean, people describe it as dragon breath, but it feels like you're just breathing fire and ice out just all at once. For me, it, it 
instantly took my breath away the minute I, I put the needle in my arm. Ball State professors Terry Heifetz and Julie Metzger led a class of 27 students on the project called Unmasked, the Stigma of Meth. The people who are kind of the centerpiece of the documentary, the, the people who are recovering addicts of meth, just have such an amazing story to tell. How they got into it in the first place and then their struggle to get out of it and the turning points along the way really left an impact on me. One of the people that's in there, Brian Graham, talks about how he was in jail and one of the guards gave him a Bible. And he read that and he said, I have to find a way to overcome this. And that leaves an impact to someone, whether they're religious or not, just hearing him say that that was kind of his turning point of making a change really affected me. And methamphetamine is basically a stimulant and long acting, so you will stay up for days at a time. Not getting sleep causes paranoia, delusions, hallucinations. I was usually part of the in crowd, but I never felt really comfortable in my own skin. I found that using kind of lubricated that. It, it made it easier. You know, I seemed to, I seemed to be able to communicate with other people um, easier and, and get them to laugh. And, and, and I, I felt like I was more of the life at the party. We really felt like it was an opportunity to take a story that a lot of people care about, or at least it's a kind of story that a lot of people should care about, and use all the platforms at our disposal to reach the widest audience. And so we have a documentary, we have a 40-page classy magazine, we have a website that includes news videos and a series of podcasts. Now I kept saying, I'm not trying to stop meth. You know, I'm trying to stop meth labs. And I'm trying to stop meth labs because of the children that we find in meth homes and the damage to those homes. If there's children present and it's in a rental property, the children are exposed to a hazard that may, they may suffer respiratory problems for the rest of their life. But it's, you know, it's all over our community. We see it, neighbors, uh, we find uh, mobile left uh, meth labs in our alleys and, you know, we see needles all over our neighborhood. We used to have these neighbors that looked out for the houses and everybody was really kind to see every day and now, you know, you see them houses empty and it's just, it's really sad. It's a rental. The landlord can't afford the thousands of dollars that it takes to clean up a meth house, so they just walk away from it. It goes off the tax rolls, it becomes a blighted house. $31.2 million a year was the number IDEM pegged uh, for the cost to homeowners for cleaning up the mess. Uh, $1.87 billion is the, the overall cost to our society on an annual basis um, that Indiana University puts on it. The Ball Brothers Foundation is underwriter for the project, which seeks to put a face on the problem. It's not just seeing someone's mugshot in, in the newspaper and that they were busted for having a meth lab in their house or for possession or for whatever it may be. It's showing these are real people who have gotten caught up in addiction to meth and other drugs. There are neighbors, there are family members, there are co-workers. And a lot of people didn't realize that before. There are a lot of people in, in Delaware County and Muncie and really all across Indiana who they hear that there's a meth problem but they don't really know how it affects them directly. This shows that they're indeed people who, who they know and care about who, who, are, who are impacted by this. One of the things that Ball Brothers really felt strongly about was that they wanted students to be in the community to see what Delaware County was really all about. And so for this kind of experience, they got to learn that. They got to see that, you know, these are real life issues for communities, not just in Indiana, but all across the country. And they talked to public officials who actually put them in uh, touch with our primary sources in this series. And they spent many hours with them, really getting to know them as real people. They saw they had families and children and hopes and dreams. And they saw that they were having to cope with this decision that they made for years afterward. And I think it really uh, it, it impacted them and I think it'll make them a better journalist going forward. The documentary and magazine are only the beginning. The group is also taking the project out to the community. We're going to have a couple of community showings of the documentary. One for probably primarily a campus audience uh, that will be shown on campus and then one in the community at, at Muncie Civic Theater as well. And we're going to have some panel discussions that follow those that that will have a little different flavor depending on the location for it.
but already we're getting feedback from people who have watched the documentary online about the impact that it's having and how they want to share this with their family, their friends. One person emailed me and said, you know, I hosted a watch party uh, at my office and we all huddled around and watched the video or watched the documentary. They said one surprise in putting this together was how willing people were to talk about the problem. I was shocked when Julie and I first started working on this. I, I said two things. Number one, no one's going to want to talk about this problem. They're going to want to sweep it under the rug and not explore it. And two, we're not going to find any students who want to do anything with this. And I was wrong on both of those. <laughs> Everyone wanted to talk about it from the mayor to the sheriff to the prosecutor to people who were addicted. Uh, Everyone wanted to talk about their story and how they want to help us overcome this problem. And from a student standpoint, I thought no students would be interested in doing a, a documentary and magazine about meth. Well, when Julie and I kind of put the call out there for students to sign up, we had almost double the number apply for it than we could accept into the project. I was stunned and the quality of the students that we got was fantastic. It seems that dealing with a problem like meth has to involve talking about it, sharing information, sharing resources. For more information on the documentary and the other materials, go to stigmaunmasked.com. To connect with the people from the Indianapolis Hiking Club, you can go to indiehike.org. And for a good walk with some friendly people anytime, check out your local mall. That's our show for today. Thanks for being with us. Hope you'll join us next time when we find more stories off the beaten path from around the state on Indiana Weekend. Funding for Indiana Weekend is provided by Midas, Fine Line Construction, and Open Door Health Services.